Welcome everyone to the Berlin Functional Programming Group second wave edition. Just a few things before we get started. Um, we have a Twitter account that you can follow and we are on Slack and we have a YouTube channel and this talk like all of the talks will be recorded and put on YouTube for posterity. Also, if you would like to support the meetup, which means supporting me and helping me pay my Zoom bill, you can buy one of our lovely t-shirts designed by yours truly. The link is in the chat. And it's just really great to have all of you um, join us this evening. I've been doing these virtual meetups now for about eight months and people seem to like them. So I'm gonna keep doing them. We have quite a few speakers lined up for the next month or so, and I'm already planning for 2021. So you can expect more of this in the future as well. Tonight, I am uh, very pleased to introduce and welcome Richard Eisenberg to the meetup. Uh, I mean, over the moon, really. I've known about Richard and his work for some time. I was saying before that I've always thought of him as Mr. Dependent Types. And uh, in my mind, he's like a, kind of a Haskell celebrity. Uh, that might make him blush a little bit, but I wasn't even sure he would write back, much less say yes to joining us. So I'm really, really pleased to have him. Um, I think he'll probably talk a lot about his own work and his interests uh, right now. And if you want to ask him some uh, insightful and penetrating questions, uh, we're gonna have a really great discussion. And uh, one thing, uh, just to let everybody know, if you do have a question, please ask your question in the chat. And if it's okay with Richard, when there's an opportune moment, I will interrupt him and allow you to unmute and ask your question yourself. If you cannot ask your question because you don't have a microphone, I can do that for you. So uh, that's all I have to say. And I'm going to hand it over to Richard. I actually did my whole introduction without spotlighting myself. This is the first time I've made that mistake. I think actually, Richard, you're already in the spotlight, but I'm gonna pin you and Please uh, take it away. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for that in introduction, Stephen. Um, uh, let's see, I have to um, figure out how to do screen sharing. Um, just one second, everyone. I think I want to do this. No, I want to do this thing. Yes. Okay. Can you see some slides? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. If I do this, can you still see some slides? Now you probably see my slide and my next slide, don't you? Yes. yes. That's fine. There's only those two. That's the whole. That's the whole slide stack. Um, so I'll just escape out of that, and instead of debugging it, we'll just go like this, which is not the prettiest, but but that's life sometimes. Um, so um, so let me sort of just give a, a quick bit of background um, on uh, uh, today's talk and, and what I do. So. Um, I am a, a, a researcher at, uh, at Tweeg. Um, so uh, my, my job as a researcher at Tweeg is to think up fun things to do with Haskell's type system and then impose that on everyone else. Um, uh, so, so a lot of that time has been spent thinking about dependent types, um, linear types. Right now, my, my big project, which I don't have much to say about because it's still early days, but I'm hoping to have a paper to submit for ICFP in, I think it's going to be due in either end of February or early March, um, on existential types. So, um, so like right now in Haskell, for all types, just sort of work, right? We don't have to think about them. They just, we have polymorphism. We don't have to really really worry about it. Um, existential types, on the other hand, are a huge pain, and I don't think they have to be. So um, so I'm hoping in the next six months or something to have uh, a new extension for GHC that just makes existential types work as easily as universal types. Um, so that's, that's something I'm thinking about these days. Um, uh, let's see. So the um, some of you also, there's some chatter um, is sort of uh, before the talk about my work on dependent types. Um, I have been thinking about dependent types on Haskell for a long time now. I'm continuing to do that. Um, uh, it, is, it is a long road, much longer than I realized it would be, um, uh, because there's lots of, of fun problems to solve. So, But I, that is definitely active and continuing. I've gotten some feedback lately saying, is anyone still working on this? Yes, very much so. 
Um, so there's a big proposal right now going on on the GHC proposals tracker about dependent types. If you want to learn more, you can you can head over there. This talk is um, is actually about the constraint solver in GHC. So we'll um, sort of get into an introduction of that in in just a minute. Um, just to sort of orient everyone, what we're what the goal is in this talk. I, I sort of like to have concrete goals in, in giving a talk. Um, so, so here are the goals for the talk. And then, uh, as you see, there's only two slides. Um, most of the talk is going to be in Emacs. Um, so, so we want to understand how constraints help us infer types, right? Haskell has this property of type inference in that we can write whole programs without writing any types, and uh, the compiler just infers types for us. And as we've become sort of more, um, we'll say, advanced in the, the way that we use types, um, Sometimes it's helpful to write type signatures because that makes good documentation. Some advanced features only work with type signatures, but but at its core, GHC is doing lots and lots of type inference, uh, even when we write type signatures, um, because type inference is not just figuring out, you know, if I write fx equals x plus one, what is the type of f? That's an important thing that type inference does, but it does a lot more than that. Every time we use a polymorphic function, type inference is what tells us sort of how to instantiate that polymorphic function at a specific type. Um, type inference is what tells us how to resolve class constraints, which is going to be one of the focuses of this talk. So, uh, so there's um, uh, there's a lot more to type inference than just what is the type of this thing. Uh, so, so that's that. So constraints are going to power all that. We'll see that in a minute. Um, we want to look at sort of how GHC solves these constraints a little bit, um, and and what exactly I mean by that. And then right now, I'm in the midst of two uh, fairly sizable commits that I'm working on within GHC. Uh, I think the first one is working out to be something like you know, 4,000 lines removed and 4,000 lines added. So really significant commit. Um, I've been probably on that for about a month and a half. Um, uh, and to talk about how, how these are going to simplify uh, GHC's constraint solver. In a way, in particular, if you're thinking about writing a type checker plugin, this will make your life much, much easier. Um, I've been recently alerted that if you've already written a type checker plugin, well, then it might mean you have to update your type checker plugin. Um, and so I, I need to reach out to the type checker plugin community about that. Maybe there's someone in this call in that community. Um, OK, so let's, let's jump in. I'm going to switch over to Emacs. Can people see Emacs? Can I see yes. some nodding? Yes, OK, good. Um, I have a few videos of, of some of the people sort of up on my other screen here, so I can actually see nods and confusion and things. That's helpful feedback. Um, OK, so, so here's our, our first example. So you can see the first thing is, is this, this compiles. Um, the uh, compiler I'm using is just 8.10. Nothing strange going on there. Most of the examples that we're going to see today are meant to compile. Some of them aren't. I'll try to define that when we get there. Um, and, and I'm also, most of these examples are meant to be quite uh, self-standing. And, and even if someone doesn't really know Haskell very much, maybe knows just a little bit enough to read the syntax, um, but knows perhaps how to program. So, so you, this idea of, of technical material is familiar. And even functional programming, that, that's helpful. Uh, but Haskell itself, we, we don't need that much syntax to do what I need to do today. Uh, so here, um, the idea is, is that I'm defining a stringable class. Um, and this, of course, uh, those of you who do know Haskell will recognize this as show, <clears throat> but I wanted to have everything self-contained here. Um, and so uh, we say that there's a two-string uh, method here. Um, and this two-string will work for any type A as long as A is in the class stringable. Uh, I say here that integers are stringable. And then here that any a list of A's is stringable as long as A's are stringable. And, and then there's implementations of these functions, uh, like all of this gobbledygook. That's not important for, for right now. Uh, and then I have this function three string, um, which calls two string on a list of, of three x's here. Now, for GHC, so I've, I've run this, and this, or I've tried to compile this, I should say, and GHC accepts this program. And so how does it know to accept this program? Well, it uses constraints. So what we can say here is in three string, we have this piece here. And so this is part of three strings type. And it says that in the body of three string, we can assume stringable A. So I'm going to write that like this, where this little annotation means given. 
So it's a given in the body of three string that stringable A holds, right? We can think of this as sort of a logical predicate. Um, then if I look at the body of three string, well, it calls two string on a list of A's, right? X here, we know X has type A because X is the one argument to three string and three string is defined right here to accept an argument of type A. Um, and, and so we know that what we want is for this two string call to work, well, we need to know that a list of A is stringable. And so I'm gonna label this with a little W in brackets because this is a wanted. And so what GHC does now is it has to solve the wanteds from the givens. And that's sort of the game that we're gonna play with all of these examples. I have 10 examples that we're gonna go through. Um, and uh, uh, um, by the way, after, after this is all done, I'm gonna post sort of the annotated versions of these programs up on my, uh, up on my webpage. Um, okay, so, so here, we have this wanted from this given. Well, how do we do this? Well, we're going to use the instance. Um, so we use instance stringable of list of A right here to say, well, this instance says as long as stringable A holds, then stringable list of A holds. So that means that from my stringable list of A wanted, I reduce that to a stringable A wanted. And then that's solved by assumption, uh, right? Because we, we have this given stringable A and then we, we had this wanted, we simplified the wanted and then we can prove it. And so that's how the program gets accepted. Um, so again, this is a pretty simple example, but this idea of givens and wanted, everything we see with type inference or 97% of what GHC does in type inference is just based on these givens and, and wanted. Um, okay, so let's move on to example number two. So again, this program compiles. So here now we have a class equable and class ordable. Of course, this is just a reinterpretation of class eek and ord, uh, which are more standard. And here I have an equals method that takes two A's um, and an ordering method, which computes an ordering on types. Again, the details aren't really all that important for here uh, for this talk. Um, but again, it's going to take sort of two arguments, both of them of type A. And now if I look at is reflexive, well, we have a given ordable A and a wanted equable A. Um, and so this given again comes from the type signature. So I say that in the body of is reflexive, we're going to have access to this ordable A constraint. So that, that becomes a given. And then we get an equable A wanted because we see here that X is the one argument to is reflexive. This argument is given here in the type signature as having type A. So we know X has type A. And then the arguments to equals are both X. Um, if, the, if you're not familiar with it, this in, in back ticks, this is just sort of an infix way of writing function applications. The same thing as if I had written equals XX. Probably should have done that in fact. Um, but now my wanted doesn't match my given. So, so I can't solve this right away. But what we see here is that on the, the declaration for ordable, we see that there's this equable and it's called a superclass constraint in Haskell. And what this really means is that we're going to guarantee that every time we have an instance for ordable, in other words, every time ordable A is true for some type A, we also have equable A being true for that same type A. Um, so some people like to think that actually Haskell got the order of this arrow wrong um, in that what this really is saying is that if we know ordable, it implies equable, which is true. So in that sense, we did sort of get the, or, the, the shape of that arrow wrong in, in the concrete syntax. Um, so what GHC does here is GHC will eagerly expand superclass constraints. So we're going to get another given equable A, right? Because we take the given ordable A and we say, well, ordable, that has a superclass, that has a superclass of equable. So we're gonna go and extract out that equable given. And then now we can solve our wanted very easily by assumption. Um, and so we see in these first two examples that sometimes GHC works backwards from its wanteds back towards its givens. 
And sometimes it takes its givens and it sort of works forward toward the wanted. It depends on what's going on, um, right? This constraint solver has grown over time and we, we keep adding new features to it as we need to, to solve new, new sort of type inference puzzles. Um, and so here to deal with superclass constraints, we do this eagerly, this eager expansion. Um, and it, it might be worth saying that the eager expansion can be kind of dumb in that if we have a particularly pernicious network of superclasses, we can get exponential behavior due to this, this eager expansion. Because um, it really does expand out all of the superclasses, uh, unless you use the extension undecidable superclasses, because then we think you might have recursive superclasses and eager expansion would be, would be uh, non-terminating. So then there's a little bit more cleverness that comes in. Um, okay, let me just slow down for a sec. Are there questions? I don't see the chat window up, although I probably could arrange for that somehow. Here, can I get the chat window? Yeah, I'm watching the chat window very carefully. I don't see any questions so far. Okay, okay, cool. But I can actually get the chat window myself, which is convenient. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next example. Okay, so here we have three. This also compiles. So in, in example three, um, now this is a little bit different. And I have not given a type signature to F. And so now GHC has to work considerably harder than we've seen before, um, just so that everyone sees it right. So we have this invert function, which is just not, and it goes from bool to bool. Um, so what's going to happen as we try to understand this definition here? So the first thing that we say is, well, F, F has no type signature. So we're going to say that F has some type alpha, um, where alpha is a unification variable. And I will always use Greek to denote unification variables. This is from a long line of, of GHC documentation. Um, and so we don't know what F's type is. So we use alpha as a stand-in. And by unification variable, that's something that as we do unification, as we try to match one type against another, we're going to learn more about alpha. And then eventually, in the end, we're going to hopefully figure out exactly what alpha is and then be able to say, report that to the user if they ask for what F's type is. Um, so we start out with just the, with F as alpha. Then as we continue to look at the definition for alpha, we see of, of F, we see that F has to take, take some argument because we've written F x equals. So we don't know much, but we know f is at least a function of one argument. So that says that we get a wanted constraint that alpha must be equal to beta arrow gamma for some beta and gamma. We don't know what they are yet, but it's going, alpha is going to be those. And because alpha is a unification variable, we can solve this wanted really easily. I'll say it's solved by unification by setting alpha equals to beta arrow gamma. Um, so now, now we don't know exactly what type F has, but it's definitely a function. Um, and it's, it's worth saying in the GHC implementation, uh, we really do use mutable update here. You know, GHC talks a big game about, oh, avoid mutation. Everything should just be pure. Actually, internally, we just use IO refs and, and we update them to do this. Um, so we solve, we solve alpha by unification. We could, we could you build up a substitution and apply it, and that would work great, except that it would be slow. Um, and so we don't want to do that. Um, now, we know that if alpha, if, if f, rather, has type beta arrow gamma, then that means that x must have type beta. So I'm just going to write that down here. It's not really a constraint, but something else that we can sort of have in our bag of facts. Just, just to and, clarify, you're, yes. you're stating the kind of the most generic possible definition of this function. We don't know anything about it, just that it's some beta to some gamma, and we want more information. That is exactly right. OK. So we just start out saying it's beta is some type. We don't know what it is. Gamma is some type. We don't know what it is. We'll, we'll figure it out pretty soon, but we don't know yet. Um, and so we see here, because x is, whoops, x is the argument to f, that it must have type beta. Um, and we also see that because the result of this call to invert is the result of f, that that must have type gamma. Um, and we see here that x is an argument to invert, and invert is expecting a bool. So pretty quickly, we're going to get wanted constraints that beta is bool, and a wanted constraint gamma is bool, right? Where this first one comes from the argument of invert, and then this comes from the result of invert. Um, these are also easy to solve. Uh, 
Um, so these are both easy to solve. Uh, so we can say beta is bool and gamma is bool. And then at this point, uh, we solved all of our wanteds. There's no more wanteds that come up. And then we see that if f has type alpha, but well, actually, f really has type beta arrow gamma. And no, we know more about we know more than that. We know that f has type bool arrow bool. And if we ask what is the type of f, indeed, we see that it's bool arrow bool. Right. And this is when I said a little while ago that everything in GHC around type inference is really around. Um, these constraints. This is sort of what I mean. We start with class constraints, but it also the way that we propagate type information through equalities. It's all through, in this case, wanted, uh, wanted constraints. We don't have any givens in this case, but we'll see those a little bit later. We have uh, a question. Yes. This is from Tom, who has asked me to ask the question for you, although you can probably see it, but for the sake of the recording. Sure. When you say unification, do you mean just the concept or the actual algorithm? I watched a Simon Peyton Jones talk, and it seemed that core has a different algorithm. So, um, I mean, there is sort of a standard unification algorithm. It's you know uh, uh, written by some Robinson. There's other, I've heard of the Robinson unification algorithm. I think it comes from the fifties. Do we implement that exactly? No, we don't, because our situation is more complicated. We have types. Robinson didn't. Um, uh, so I think I probably mean the concept, although there really is a unification algorithm. There's actually at least two unification algorithms implemented in GHC, maybe a third, depending on how you count. Um, but I, I think let's just stick with the more the concept than the algorithm for now. Um, I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Um, okay. Okay. Thanks. Makes sense. Good. Um, okay. So then let's move on to the next example, number four. Um, okay. So here now things are getting a little bit more complicated. And this example, the interesting thing here is this does not compile. Um, but the interesting thing in this example is that. Um, it shows how these constraints actually affect error messages. So we're going to look down at the error messages that we get in this example. So here we're using ORD and NOT. Now ORD expects a car, NOT expects a bool. And so in both F and G, I apply ORD and NOT to the same X. I don't have any type uh, uh, signatures on F or G, so we don't know what, X, what type X should have to begin with. But we do know it can't be both car and bool. What's interesting about the error messages here is that they are different. So uh, here we see that in F, it says can't match expected type bool with actual type car. Down in G, we have expected type car with actual type bool. So sort of previewing that the error messages are different, let's see what happens with the constraints. Here. And we'll see why that difference in error messages comes up. Even though if we look at F and G, the, the bodies of these are really very, very similar, right? This is just a pair construct. It shouldn't matter what order I write things in in a pair. And yet we see in the error messages that it does matter. So let's look at F first. So in F, uh, now uh, I'm just going to skip the first few steps of this. And we're just going to say that X has type alpha here, because that's the interesting piece. In reality, we would say, oh, F has type alpha. And then we learn that alpha really must be beta arrow gamma. But we're not going to do that for all the examples. We're just going to say we're going to jump a, a little bit ahead to the X has some type alpha. We don't know what. And then we see from the ORD this, this usage. OK, so X here is used as the argument to ORD. ORD is expecting a car. So that means we're going to get a wanted alpha equals car, solved by unification. Um, and so here we get alpha equals car. And now that we know that alpha equals car, and then we encounter this x over here. Now x is used as the argument to not. At this point, we know that x has type car. Not is expecting something of type bool. So we end up with a wanted car equals bool. We're not going to be able to solve that. And so that ends up getting printed as an error message. So um, another interesting thing to learn here is an unsolved wanted 
is really just an error that, that we're going to report. And that's really how GHD works internally. So it keeps track of these wanteds and givens. There's a structure that keeps track of them. And whatever is unsolved at the end of constraint solving, that's what appears as error messages. Um, so in this case, because this first use of x set the type of x to be car, we say that x is actual type for f. Let me scroll up on my errors here. X's actual type is car, but it's expected type. It's type as we expect from the context of, call of, of passing it to not is bool. So we see this use of expected and this use of actual. In G, of course, it goes the other way around, right? And G is, is essentially the same, except that the first occurrence of X tells us that X has actual type bool. And then the expected type here is car. And so we end up, the error message gets flipped. So what's the, what's the takeaway from this example? Um, of course, both of these error messages are, are about equivalent. I, would expect, I wouldn't expect that one would be that much easier to understand than the other. But the, the important thing is, is to see how order of code, even though it shouldn't really matter, can matter in error messages. Um, and that understanding how GHC solves constraints can be helpful in understanding why it produces an error message the way it does. Um, so I could go through all of this for G as well, but it would be a little re repetitive. Um, okay, so let me close that so I don't end up with a parse error. Still have those other errors. Yes, good. Um, okay, let's look at the next example, uh, number five. Um, so number five is meant to accept. Now, here we, we have to get quite a bit more complicated um, because we're trying to show a sort of a subtler interaction uh, among all of these different constraints. Um, but but well, I'll, I'll try to walk us through it. So here we have, uh, oh, the other thing is, is that up until now, you know, the examples have been sort of, you know, one could imagine what they are, what they are doing. The examples from, from here on out um, are, are quite contrived, but we're really just focusing on how they affect type inference. Um, all of these have more realistic, uh, sort of more practical scenarios that they could come up in. But, but we're going to focus on having sort of the small nub of the problem and not maybe a realistic setting. Uh, so here we have a multi-parameter type class C, um, which, which has, uh, takes arguments of types A and B, which are both uh, parameters of the type class with some method meth. Um, and, and then we have this slightly peculiar instance that says that we have an instance for C of maybe A and B, as long as A can be compared for equality. And then there's some body. That, this doesn't matter at all. Um, and now we have this rather more complicated scenario down here. So we have to look at what's going to happen with our constraints as we try to understand this F. So the first thing we see is in F's type, we get a given C, maybe A, bool. Right? I'm just reading that straight from the type here. Um, we're going to see that X has type alpha because X is the argument to F, or sorry, not alpha, I misspoke. X has type A. Um, and A is listed here as the type of that first argument. But then the next thing that we see as we read left to right is this lambda expression. Um, and so we don't know what type Y is going to have. So we're going to just say that Y has some type alpha. We're not sure what it's going to be. Uh, let me recenter the window here for a little bit more room. Um, and then we see that we're calling meth at just Y and false. OK, so that means because I'm calling meth, so it's going to be a wanted for class C. And it's going to be C. Well, what's the first argument? Well, the first argument has type maybe alpha, right? because this just is going to take an argument of type alpha and turn it into a maybe alpha. Um, and then the second argument to meth is, uh, has type bool. So I get a wanted C maybe alpha bool. And at this point, we might think that, we, um, that we, we sort of look around and we try to figure out what can we do with this wanted? Can we solve this wanted? Um, so we see here that there's this given. But the given only applies to a type A. It doesn't say anything about sort of unknown type alpha. So this given doesn't really apply. On the other hand, this instance up here, this should be true for any A and for any B. 
including an A that is alpha and a B that is bool. So it looks like we may want to use this instance out here. Um, it turns out, though, if we use the instance and we get wanted eek alpha, right? Um, and that's, we get that wanted eek alpha because of that constraint on the instance. If we go that route, we would end up not being able to satisfy eek alpha and we would run into trouble. But yet we see down here that actually this, this example is meant to compile. So what, what, what GHC does at this point is it says, well, this instance applies. I could use that, but maybe, just maybe that given will be a better choice later. And so one of the things that GHC is very careful about is it never wants to backtrack. So it never wants to commit to a course of action when there's another plausible uh, uh, course of action that might be better. And in this case, we see that if this given were to apply, that would be a better solution because it has no constraints. If this given applies, then we're done. Whereas if this instance applies, well, then there's still some more work to do. And so GHC is very careful about not making sort of an early choice when something else might be helpful later. So in this case, we don't actually do this. Um, uh, where those slashes are meant to sort of be represent a barrier of some sort. They're not a C comment. Um, so um, uh, so we, 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 we sort of skip over that and we say, well, this wanted, well, we're just going to say we don't know what to do with this yet. Um, and now we go on and we see that this lambda expression is applied to x. So that tells us this lambda expression is going to take an argument of type alpha, but it's being supplied with an actual argument of type A. So this tells us whoops, that alpha equals A. Um, and, um, and so if we know that alpha equals A, we can solve by unification. And once we solve that by unification, we rewrite our wanted. And we say, now our new wanted, whoops looks like this, right? because we've learned about alpha. And now that we've learned about alpha, our new wanted looks like this. And hooray, that's exactly the same as our given. And we can succeed. But the whole thing depends on not accidentally falling for this trap of, of, of using this instance. And so there's a particular block of code in GHC that checks for exactly this scenario. So we don't end up sort of falling into that trap. Um, okay, let's see. So I see in the chat window that a question has come up. I'll, uh, I'll just sort of read it for the recording here um, uh, from Mateus. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, but if the lambda expression is applied to x and x has type A, can't we safely deduce, oh, that alpha is A and therefore y is, yes, 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 yes. So, um, so you, I think, asked that question before we got, got, got to that point. So we can, we can do all of that, but perhaps GHC encounters are wanted before getting all of that insight. And that's the, that's the part that we have to block. Was B important at all? Um, no, no, in this case, I could have just had, had bool there and that would have been just fine. Um, so old wanted are removed when new ones are discovered. No, um, uh, I wouldn't say that old wanted are removed when, when new ones are discovered. In this case, this, this wanted has been solved. So that one goes away. And this one has been simplified. So it's not that this one is removed, but this one directly led to this one down here. So, so we say that this one is essentially solved by this one, if that makes any sense. We sort of say we, that we solve one wanted with another. Um, I'm not doing a good job in my little comments here, sort of keeping track of the flow of these things, because it's a little hard to do that in, in, in this format. Uh, but in the end, both of these end up sort of getting taken care of, and then this one is also taken care of. Um, so, okay, so, so then Frederick asks, I thought the, the given would be expanded eagerly, or the give, this given here would be expanded eagerly to a given eek a. So that's a good guess, um, but here this eek a constraint is a constraint on a particular instance. Previously, when we saw that eager expansion, 
that was a constraint on a class, which is in some sense saying that all instances of this class will share this fact. Whereas here, we're just saying this one particular instance. Um, and so we can't do this eager expansion. It's sort of a, a different mechanism. Um, okay, so I think that's exhausted questions for now. Um, let's move on to, oops, let me close my comment. Let's move on to number six. Um, okay, so number six has, has an intentional error. So we'll, um, we'll see where that comes from as we sort of read through this. Um, so the first thing is, um, again, I have to sort of do some slightly complex stuff in GHC to make this example work without getting a much larger program. Um, so one is by turning on, it's actually on by default, but I wanted to make it explicit, this thing called the monomorphism restriction. We'll get back to that in a minute. Um, GHC also has a defaulting mechanism, which if it doesn't know the type of something, it will try things like integer, you know, will integer work, will int work, will unit work, it tries a few of these. This disables the defaulting mechanism because I don't want that in play here. Um, we're gonna need this function const uh, later on. So we'll, I've just gotten it ready. Um, and, and so here we have, we're defining an is int class but the superclass constraint of isInt is this a twiddle int. So this twiddle is a syntax in Haskell meaning type equality. So this, this class is, again, this is quite contrived, but basically we're saying anything that has an isInt instance must be int. Um, that's, that's what these, um, these are, are, are saying. And we'll see how this comes into play a little bit later. Uh, I've also introduced a numeric class here, which has one function plus and one instance that's only over int. So now let's look at, at our definition. So again, there's no type signature here. And we see that there's that, that, that this errors, but let's look at the at sort of the constraints, to try to understand where this error comes from. Um, so here we see F is gonna have some type alpha. Then when we get to F's right-hand side, we learn pretty quickly that we get a wanted that alpha, this is a lambda expression, so alpha must equal beta arrow gamma, um, solved by unification. Um, at this point, we learn that X really has type beta. And then if plus is to be applicable to X and X, we must get a wanted numeric beta. Right, because X has type beta, the argument to plus is, is X, that has type beta. And we know that for plus to be applicable, um, that we must indeed uh, um, get this wanted constraint. So normally without various sort of extra steps that I've taken here, GHC would then abstract over this. So in particular, if I move the X to the left of the equal sign like this, and I close my comment so I don't have a parse error. GHC is quite happy with this. And we can ask, what is the type of F? Oh, well, the type of F is just for, for any numeric A, A arrow A. But I have sneakily not defined it this way. I have sneakily put lambda X on the right-hand side of the equal sign. When I do that, uh, the, the monomorphism restriction applies. And if GHC sees a definition that looks like it should just be defining an ordinary variable, it will refuse to automatically quantify the right-hand side and assume a constraint. Um, there's various good reasons for this. Um, if we want to talk about this later, uh, we can. I don't want to get too distracted by it right now. But the bottom line is, is that when I try to compile this, we get errors saying that I don't know, um, or rather that, that we don't know what A0 should be and therefore we can't solve the constraint numeric A0. So in this error message, what I'm calling beta in my commentary here is being called A0. When we see error messages from GHC with sort of zeros and ones pinned on the end, oftentimes, but not always, they are unification variables. Um, if we ever see a zero at the end, those are unification variables, but sometimes GHC puts ones on other things too. Um, so it's saying that we don't know what beta should be. And so we can't sort of make any forward progress here. 
So what I need to do is I need to give GHC a little bit of extra information. So we see up on the top of the screen this const function. And the const function just takes the first argument and returns it. So I should be able to put whatever I want over here, and it shouldn't matter at all. But if I do this, something fun will happen. Now, suddenly, my program is accepted. So let's, let's see why. So all of this stuff down here is still true. We still get numeric beta. But now, my tag as int constraint tells me, gives me a new wanted is int beta. And if I have the is int um, uh, wanted, then, then what I actually can do is I can look at the superclass constraints of that class. And we said earlier that when there's a superclass constraint, that's going to be true any time the constraint is true. So if I'm trying to prove is int, then I can um, I can expand superclasses, not to become, that's not accurate, to get wanted beta is int. Let's see, how much of this can I get on the screen at the same time? Um, now that, so we can solve that by unification, beta now equals int. And then once I solve this by unification, then I'm just going to rewrite this in place. This becomes is int int. We can solve by instance. And then this also becomes int. And that can solve by instance. And then everything is OK. So what's, what's interesting here is that I've added this extra piece, which shouldn't matter, right? Because const always ignores the second argument. But the second argument gives us extra constraints, which informs the constraint solver and allows us to accept this program. Um, so the interesting, the, the new interesting thing here is that here we have a wanted, where the key step is expanding superclasses of a wanted. Previously, it was of a given, but it's actually also helpful to do for wanteds. Um, OK, let's move on to example seven. So in example seven, now we have a new complication in that we're dealing with type families here. So those of you who haven't worked with type families, a type family is basically just a function that happens in types. Um, so just as much as we might have, you know, uh, you know, f of x equals three plus x, and that could be a normal term level function. Well, a type family f, we could have, you know, f of x equals maybe of list of x, right? That would that could be the the type family f. Um, we have an inject function, which just takes an A into an FA. Um, we don't really have enough tools in this file to make an interesting definition of inject. We need some class constraints and some other stuff that I didn't want to get involved here. But then we have two type inference problems. Um, so, both, so this file succeeds. But figuring out what the type of F and what the type of G are is, is not easy. So we're going to look at F first. So in F, we get we start out with x has type alpha, um, and then over here we see that x is used as the argument to inject. But the argument to inject can be any type a, so that doesn't really constrain us at all. But we we see that the result of inject in this case is going to have type f alpha, not uh, expects a bool. So all of this will add up to get a new wanted constraint that bool equals f a, sorry, f alpha, um, right? And that's because we start with x it has type alpha, inject x is going to have type f alpha, and not expects an argument of type bool. So that's how that's going to build up to that constraint there. And, and there's nothing more to say about that. There's no, there's no more information we can get about alpha. So in this case, because I have an x on the left of the equal sign, so this really looks like a function of GHC. The monomorphism restriction that we saw last time won't apply. And when I compile, I can ask for the type of f, 
And what happens here is that we're going to take this alpha and say, well, I don't know anything about alpha. So let's just say it could be any type A. Um, and we end up generalizing over the wanted constraint and inferring a type for F that involves, um, that involves this type A. And, and so this, this little f is applicable to any argument A so long as F A equals bool. Um, and it returns a bool because not returns a bool up here. Um, okay, so that's what's happening in, in F here. Let's look at G. So in G, now once again, we're gonna say the X has type alpha. And then here, lists in Haskell are homogeneous, meaning that the type of X and the type of inject X always have to be the same. And so in this case, we get a constraint or wanted alpha equals F of alpha. But once again, there's no further that we can get with this. So we're going to quantify over that once again. So now if I ask for the type of G, we see that the type of G is this, that as long as F of A, for any type A, as long as F of A equals A, then we're good. Um, and we take something of type A and we're gonna return a list of that type. Um, so I think it's pretty impressive actually that GHC will infer a constraint like this, where it mentions that same A on both sides of the equality. Um, I think that those can be hard to work with sometimes. Um, so, um, so here we can, we can see how sometimes if there's an unsolved wanted, we just end up abstracting over it. By contrast, if we go back to uh, example, was it, was it three? No, four. If we look at example four, here we also have a wanted constraint, but we don't quantify over this one, right? And the reason for that is, is we could potentially um, in fact, I think this is now going off the rails slightly, but let's see what happens. Oops. This may not work. Oh, well, that's yes. No, I don't, no, it, it doesn't like this. Um, so um, uh, in theory, this should be accepted, right? Here, the, 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 the point I'm trying to make here is that if we have an unsolved wanted, we can try to abstract over it. Um, and in some sense, from a logical standpoint, this definition of F is sensible, right? If car equals bool, then this function is well-typed. Um, but GHC solver is not designed to work with these kinds of impossible equalities because they're, they're useless in practice. Um, and so GHC is, is sort of not clever enough to, to be able to accept this. We have another in question. Of, um, oh, oh, good. Okay, I'll get to that in, in just a moment. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, oh, actually, Manuel has, has answered it for me. That's quite similar to, to what I might have said, but I'll, I'll expand on that in a minute. Um, so... Uh, so the difference with the type family is because it's a function and we don't really know its behavior yet. We're allowed to sort of impose conditions on it and say, oh, it's, if, if um, you know, if the function has a particular shape and the type has a particular shape, then, then we can make progress. Whereas here, we don't wish to do that. We don't wish to abstract over these impossible equalities. Um, let me sort of rewind the changes here. Okay, so back to seven. Okay, so the question is, can this constraint, uh, let's look at type of G again, can this constraint mean anything other than F is the identity? Uh, and, and the answer is, is yes. Here, this, isn't, this doesn't have to be true for all A, this has to be true for one specific A. So for example, if I were to further define this and say that f of int equals int and f of anything else equals bool, right? So far, oh, now I'm getting complaints. Why am I getting complaints? Oh, because I haven't imported int, that's silly. Okay, there we go. Um, 
So here, I can still call g. I can call g on an int. Oh, well, that's not a surprise. Let's not actually try to evaluate this, but we'll just see if it's well typed. Can I call g on an int? Yes, I can. Um, can I call g on a bool? Yes, I can. Can I call g on a character? No, I can't. Because can't match bool with car, um, because here f of car will be bool, and f, so f of a does not equal a. Good question. Um, but let me get rid of this. Don't want that in the final version. OK. Um, OK, let's move on to number eight. OK, so number eight, we get things uh, a little bit more complicated. Um, here is a case we don't uh, want to accept this program. Um, but let's look at what's happening down here with the givens and the wanted. So here we have a class C with one method meth. Um, we're going to say that C has an instance uh, uh, for any list A, but it has a particular instance for bool. Um, so uh, this, this method, again, this is, this is a little bit contrived in that we can't really observe the difference between these. Um, but we could imagine in general that this uh, instance of the method would have a different implementation than the general case. Um, so with that in mind, let's, let's, let's look at the givens and the wanteds here for f. So uh, we get, we're going to get pretty quickly that x has type alpha. And then x gets injected. So that means that that uh, we can we'll just sort of write out these, these different steps. So inject x is going to have type f alpha. And list of inject of x is going to have type list of f alpha. And then because we're calling meth on that, we're going to get a wanted constraint for wanted c of list of, alpha, of f alpha. Um, and then the question is, whoops, we've lost our instance. Um, the question is, can we solve that wanted? And it looks like we have a choice here. We could use, well, we could, we could look at, at this instance. And that instance certainly looks very applicable. Um, and so when we're looking at that instance, it looks like here, you know, does A, um, could A match up with F alpha? Oh, sure it does. But before GHC commits to using an instance, we saw another example of this a few examples ago. Before GHC commits to an instance, it wants to make sure that there's no other instance out there which might be better. Um, and so in this case, this bool instance, well, depending on what f alpha really turns out to be, the bool instance might be better. And so in practice, GHC won't commit to an instance. And that's the error that we get here. Overlapping instances. We don't know which instance to choose. Both of these apply. Um, and so, so, so now we're going to get into uh, um, some of the details of the particular simplifications that I'm looking at uh, uh, applying in GHC today, um, which is, well, what happens with this f alpha, right? We want, we want to be able to say that this one applies, but this one might apply later. And so the way that GHC does this is, um, is using uh, sort of a different unification algorithm. This connects back to that question about the unification algorithm, in that we want to see, does bool unify with f alpha? Well, it doesn't look like bool unifies with f alpha, so it'd be very easy to make a mistake here. So actually, what GHC does today is it takes any of these um, type family applications and it simplifies them. Uh, so in particular, what we're going to do is we're going to change this wanted to become two wanteds. Um, so here I've introduced a new variable called FMV. Um, which internally in GHC is called a flattened meta variable. Um, and, and this flattened meta variable is essentially a stand-in for F alpha. 
The advantage of doing this step is now when I look at C of list of FMV, it's really much more obvious that either of these instances might apply. A could become FMV or FMV could become bool because if FMV is a variable, maybe it can, it can become anything. Um, and so at this point, GHC says, okay, well, I can't solve these wanted. So uh, we're just gonna issue an error. And that's, and that's as far as we can get. And, but the way that we did it was by doing this flattening, excuse me, this flattening step to convert a, um, a type family application like F alpha into this fresh variable FMV. Um, okay, let's move on to example nine. Um, so this is one that is expected to be accepted. This is a fairly simple one actually. Uh, but let's look at, at how this one works. So here we're going to get a given FA equals bool. We see here that X has type FA, right? That, I can just read that from the fact that the type here, the second argument has type FA and X is the second argument to F. Um, and then we get a wanted that at FA, the type of X right here must equal bool, the argument to not. So you might think that GHC just says, ah, oh, we have given FA equals bool, wanted FA equals bool. That's really easy. Um, but GHC likes to be even more clever around equalities and not just do that. So it uses equalities for rewriting, and then it's going to solve this in a different way. So, so actually what ends up happening is that this given, so this is going to become flattened to uh, FSK equals bool, which is a flattened skolem. It's very related to a flattened merit meta variable, uh, but it comes from givens instead of wanted. And then another given, FA equals FSK. This wanted gets flattened to uh, FMV equals bool and FA equals FMV. Um, uh, there's a great question that just popped up in the chat. Thank you, I will get back to that. Um, so we get here and then now, um, let's see what happens at this stage. So then at this stage, So this gets solved by the given. So we'll end up with FMV equals bool. There's sort of a complicated step that GHC takes to relate all of this together, to discover that FMV should really be bool. And then uh, we end up, so we're gonna call this W2, because it's our second wanted. So then rewrite W2 to become um, bool equals bool which could be solved by reflexivity. Um, so, um, okay. So, so this ends up getting solved, but it gets solved in a very roundabout way, right? We end up introducing flattened scolums and, um, and, and flattened meta variables. And we have to have this complicated matching step between the meta variables and the scolums. It's a whole lot of mess to do something simple. And so this is really what I set out to simplify. Uh, so, but before I get there, let me, let me address the question here. So, um, uh, so Manuel, do you want to, to come in and ask your question? Sure, so I actually wanted to ask the question already in the last example, um, but I wasn't quite ready then. The uh, question is basically um, the error message that GHC emitted in your last example um, didn't look as horrible as it um, as what you've written there. It sort of reinserted back this uh, flattened meta meta variable, uh, which makes it easier to read. I mean, otherwise the error message would be even harder to read because it would say something about three different constraints and you'd have to insert it for yourself and so on. And so I was just curious uh, how, how that works.
It works by the unflattener. Um, so, so here, this is in the GHC source code um, that we have. This is a fairly recent checkout of the GHC source code. And after all of this flattening stuff, but before error reporting, if they're unsolved uh, wanted, we unflatten going through all of this code to, to try to undo this transformation that we've done um, to do exactly what, what you were suggesting of, of to, in, in order to get a better, better error message. So that's very, you're paying very close attention to this talk. Um, but yes, that, that must be a separate step. Um, other questions? And, and, and by the way, just, just if anyone's wondering, we are, we are nearing the end. There's only 10 examples that I'm going through. There's only one more. Um, okay, so, so here we, we see in example nine and actually in example eight a little bit that this flattener is, is, is complicated. So the first big simplification I'm working on right now is getting rid of the flattener. Um, so that code that I just showed you, I had to be careful not to open up the actual fork or the actual tree that I'm, that I'm working on because the unflattener is gone in my, in my branch, but I happen to have a checkout of, of, of head. Um, and so I could show that to you. And so in, with my new simplified version, I'm just gonna move that out of the way. It is much simpler. We do get a given FA equals bool. Uh, we still get X has type FA and we get a wanted FA equals bool and then use the given to rewrite the wanted. And then we're done. Much simpler, no flattening scolums, no flattening meta variables. The big change is that now, instead of doing this, this big intermediate step, we just allow um, something like a type family application to be the target of a rewriting operation. Um, one challenge with this is, if we go back to number eight, a key step here was noticing that bool and f alpha might sort of come together at some point. And so, so extra care has to be taken when doing unification um, to make sure that we don't say that bool and f alpha are distinct. We have to say, well, bool and f alpha might end up getting together at some point, even though bool and maybe alpha never would, right? There's a real fundamental difference between maybe or list, which always stands for itself, and something like f, which is really a function that can evaluate. Um, and so the internal algorithms in GHC need, need to take this into account. And so it turned out that an example like this was a bug in my branch when I first got rid of the flattener. It's one of the reasons it made, it made its way into this talk. So this is a vast improvement to get rid of the flattener. Um, in some cases, it improves compile time by almost 20%. Um, uh, because it, that's a, that particular case has lots and lots of type families. It's not a very typical program at all. But um, it's, this, this should be a nice little performance when, when I'm all done with it. Um, okay, so let's look at example 10. Um, so in example 10, um, here we have another case where it does not compile, um, but let's, let's look at, at, at what's going on here. So once again, we have a type family FA and um, we have here, we're gonna get that B has type FA and C has type FA. This is just from reading off the type signature and seeing the type, the values B and C down here. But then I get a wanted or B, uh, or not, that's not a wanted. I see or B, so that must mean that B is a car or rather that the type of B is a car. So we get FA equals car. And then here, well, the C or or rather results in something of type int. We're adding that to C. Um, C has type FA. So this tells us that FA has type int. Um, and, and so we might sort of wonder about how to solve these. Well, one possible approach to doing type inference is to say, well, if, if, if we know that FA equals car, then every time we see FA, we could think about rewriting it to car. Um, 
Um, the problem is if we did that, we would end up with a very bad error message, right? The error message would say can't match car with int. Instead, the actual error message that we see is can't match car with fa, um, which is more direct. Interestingly, we don't also see can't match, there's not another error message off the top here. We don't also see can't match int with fa, right? Because one of the two uh, can potentially match depending on the, the definition of f, uh, of capital F. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the upshot here is that we have to be careful in the constraint solver just because we can do something sort of rewriting in this way with a wanted. It's sort of a valid move logically um, in that we're only going to accept the program if we can solve all the wanted. So maybe we can just assume that we've solved them even before we have. Um, but by doing so, we can get really bad error messages. So the second simplification Um, or, or rather, before I can say the simplification, so the current story in GHC is uh, that it, instead of using wanted, it uses something else called a derived constraint, where a derived constraint never gets reported as an error, but derived constraints can rewrite other derived constraints. And so in, in the cases that look like this, sometimes we use these derived constraints to make more progress than we could uh, just with wanted. My second simplification, though, is get rid of derives. Simply by tracking when one wanted constraint will rewrite another. So in, in this particular scenario, what would happen is that this I've written here could potentially rewrite. In, um, in another branch that I'm working on that's, that gets rid of these derives, this actually happens and it will rewrite to car equals int. Um, but then we're very careful about what error messages that we print, right? Because the idea is that we never want to print out a, an error message that comes from a wanted constraint that's been rewritten by another wanted constraint. because doing so is really confusing. Um, and if we have a bunch of unsolved wanted constraints, I should say by another unsolved wanted. Um, and so if we have a bunch of unsolved wanted constraints, a little inductive argument says at least one of them um, uh, won't have this property. And so we can print at least one error message. And, and that's what we're going to end up doing. Um, it's another vast simplification. That one isn't quite in the stages that I can give you line numbers, but I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping that it can be quite a lot of code deleted. Um, anyway, that's, that's the end of, of, of the talk. I'm happy to answer more questions or we can chat about other things that aren't related to the talk. Um, I hope this has been sort of a little bit of view into how GHC sees the world and, and, and how it, it tries to solve things. Um, thanks for listening. Thank you, Richard. That was very interesting. It's always interesting to have a, a tour of the inner workings of GHC. Sure. Um, uh, we maybe can give people a minute if they want to ask any questions. Uh, I think you're up for discussion about anything. Yes. In your bailiwick, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, I'm going to turn off screen sharing. There we go. Maybe. Um, Maybe to give people the opportunity to think of some questions, you want to say something about um, the current situation with dependent types, since this is a hot topic on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and so, someone just someone someone has just asked about this. Two people, in fact. Oh, something about type families and dependent types, and also yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always happy please, to talk. Please talk types. about dependent types. <laughs> um, yeah. So what's to say? Um, are type families useful with dependent types? No. Um, I, I hope so. Well, no is, is sort of my, my quick flippant response. The technology and all of the sort of the careful thought around type families is important because um, the idea of a type family is it's something that can do computation at compile time. 
And if we have a full dependently typed language, then we're going to have functions that can do computation at compile time. And all the stuff that we have to be careful about with type families, we'll have to be careful about with functions. The big difference is there won't be a separate syntax for them. So I'll just be able to define a function and use it in types. Very simple. Um, but the implementation, all the implementation work is, 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 is work well worth doing. It's not at all going to be sort of duplicated or, or, or gotten rid of. Um, I am hoping in the far future, just because removing features is slow, um, in the far future, we will just get rid of type families. We don't need them. Um, what has been your experience with Idris? So yeah, Idris. Um, in terms of uh, uh, in, in terms of what I mean, I've done some programming in Idris, not a whole ton. Uh, just in terms of the dependent types, uh, and maybe why do we want this to in Haskell as well? Um, yeah, sure. So, I mean, my my whole attitude toward this is, uh, you know, I make mistakes a lot, and I like not to suffer for my mistakes. And suffering happened when my users, after I finish writing an application and I send it out, and then my users don't like me because I've introduced bugs. Um, and so my whole shtick is around more sort of static checking around errors. And dependent types allow that, uh, or, or allow more of that. Um, so so it, this, is, this is certainly very possible in Idris. Um, I've done some programming in Idris, I find if you sort of stick to the prescribed script in Idris of doing things just the right way and everything is good and hunky-dory, it works really, really well. As soon as you start doing other things, either intentionally or by accident, then you get off the rails quickly and get some terrible error messages and crash the compiler and, and, and stuff happens. And that's not really a rub against Idris. Idris is still young, and there hasn't been as much time for it to sort of mature and deal with crazy programmers as well as as, as GHC has. Um, so it's it's been sort of a good experience in that regard. I also think Idris does a fantastic job with interactive error messages. I love that about Idris, and I've been trying to get GHC to do that for a long time. You tried the Idris two and this uh, relevancy feature. Yes. So. Um, so Idris 2 is based on a type theory called quantitative type theory, um, which sort of mixes linear types with this idea of relevance. Um, so we can say in Idris 2 that a certain argument is used zero times in, in, a, in a function's right-hand side. And what that really means is, is that if it's a dependent argument, we can use it later on in the type, but not in, in the term. So I'm just going to type in, in the Zoom chat here. Um, so if we imagine a, a function, um, I'll call it id-like. And it makes a erasure explicit in the syntax as well. Yes. So this is how you would you you could write id like in, in Idris. I don't know if Idris accepts semicolons the way Haskell does. Um, uh, but um, uh, let's see. Um, so so here that zero, you'll see that there's a, a sort of a zero I've snuck in there next to the a when I've bound the a. That means that we can't use that a anywhere on the right-hand side of id like's definition. So my definition that I gave was id like underscore x equals x. If I said something like id like a x equals a, I would get an error because I put a zero there saying I can't use it at all. But of course, I can use it later on in id like's type. Um, and uh, um, that. This zero, another way of saying it is that this argument A is irrelevant or it can be erased. Um, I don't know if that's a full answer to the question. Um, but it's very cool stuff. And I'm hoping that, uh, and believe, not just hoping, um, that dependent types in Haskell will have something similar. So I will shamelessly plug uh, uh, my upcoming Popple paper, which is very cool. But it's not easy going. Um, let me get a link. Here's the link. So 
it basically takes this idea of a quantitative type theory, adapts it to Haskell, and shows that we'll be able to get type erasure, even, uh, even with dependent types. I can um, share this later with the meetup and as a comment to the video. OK, cool. Thanks. And uh, thanks for the, the follow-up question about Idris, too. Uh, friend of the meetup, Edwin Brady, of course. He was uh, a speaker back in the summertime. So we have a few questions now uh, lined up. Um, Manuel, you have a question? If you'd like to unmute. Manuel? Maybe he's not there anymore. OK, well, the question is if there was one language extension or a language feature that you could remove in order to make constraint solving in GHC easier, what would it be? Uh, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, I mean, various features impose burdens on the constraint solver, but I can't think of any feature that by itself imposes a large burden on the constraint solver. So, you know, there's various places we have to worry about overlapping instances, but they're fairly small in the scheme of things. That's not so hard. Um, before this, the, before the simplification, type families were really quite pervasively annoying, but now they're not. Um, so, so that's better. Quantified constraints, you know, they add a little complication, but also fairly isolated. There's nothing that sort of sits over the constraint solver generally and, and sort of hurts everyone. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's anything in particular there. Okay, next question is from Henry. Henry, can you unmute? Hey, hi, yeah. It's just um, a really brief question, and I'm kind of hoping more that it might help clarify the difference between type families and data families in my head, because I always have to look them up again and see sure. what, which one's appropriate. But I'm just wondering if GHC treats type inference differently in the two cases. It does indeed. Um, so the difference between a type family and a data family is that data families um, are, uh, are generative, while type families are not. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if, if I know, um, oh, wait. Uh, maybe I should do screen share because I'm going to have to do a little bit of text here and the, the chat doesn't get preserved in the recording. So let me turn screen sharing back on. But I need to now find the right window to include here. No, 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 no. Ah, there it is. Okay, I have a lot of windows open. There we are. Okay, can you all see Emacs again? Yes. yes I see a nod. Great. Okay. Um, so. Uh, suppose we know that a b equals t int, and we conclude a equals t, b e equals int. Yes, if t is a data family, no, if t is a type family. Um, so if you want sort of the inference to be able to decompose like this, you need a data family. Um, if you don't need that kind of decomposition in your type inference, then type families are a little bit more flexible. Does that answer the question? I guess we can assume it does. Okay. And the yeah, question. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Sorry. I was just typing it into the side there. Uh, so it seems like the data families have a little more structure built into them. It's, it's an easier job. Um, yes, that's right. Okay, then Jan has a question, and I think I have to ask. Let me scroll back up. Are liquid types a strict subset of dependent types? 
For example, would it be possible to integrate liquid Haskell and desugar that to dependent types? Yes, and I really want to do this. Um, so uh, liquid types are a strict subset of dependent types. Um, so liquid types, uh, if you, for those of you who have not yet sort of explored liquid Haskell, I strongly encourage you to. It's some really, really cool stuff. Um, and it allows you to say essentially that instead of something having type int, maybe you can have type int such that it's an even int. And then we can actually track that statically and, and then use a separate solver to sort of prove various properties. It's very, very cool stuff. Um, there are things that dependent types can do that, that refinement types can't. Um, uh, if I didn't say it, if, if, if liquid types are sort of the impl an implementation of refinement types. Um, and I, I, do, I want to do exactly this and to, to desugar liquid Haskell into dependent types and keep the option of having an SMT solver, which is what liquid Haskell does today, sort of sitting on top so that you can basically have your liquid Haskell code more or less exactly as it is today, but have it work with dependent types under the hood. And so that way, if everything you need to do is in the sort of the simple refinement type part of your language, great, you never have to worry about dependent types. But maybe you're in a case where 90% of what you wanna do can be done with liquid Haskell. And then there's this other part that's more complicated. Right now you're stuck, there's sort of not much you can do. Um, but uh, uh, if we can desugar liquid Haskell into dependent Haskell, then, then you could sort of do whatever you wanted under the hood, be very powerful. Um, a key step to that is better existentials actually, um, which is, the, that's one of the, concrete bits of motivation for this work I'm hoping to present at ICFP next year. I saw Nikki Vazu give a talk at Zurihack a couple years ago. I should, I, I should invite her to join us. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. She's fantastic. Jo join us virtually in Berlin. Yeah. Uh, Tom has another question. How would the type checker integrate SMT with partial evaluation? Oh, oh an easy one. So that I may not be able to answer fully because I don't know as much about integration with SMT solvers. I know SMT solvers consider functions to be sort of these uninterpreted symbols that just have, you know, we, we sort of assume several equations on them. If they're not fully applied, then what could we assume? They might just end up to be sort of constants. Um, which is about right. Um, this that's uh, not much of an answer. I don't think I have a good answer to that question. I'm going to skip. Okay, I don't see any other questions right now. But uh, actually, I think we had some really great questions tonight. I'm really happy to see that. Any uh, topics in particular you'd like to raise yourself? Things you're working on right now? No, I mean, you know, this this whole talk. This is, I mean, this flattener patch. Um, you know, after I get off the call, I might go back and start continuing performance tuning on it. I mean, that's that's like what I'm working on right now. Um, I'm actually uh, very curious about your transition from uh, academia to industry. Sure, yeah, I'm very happy to talk about that. So yeah, so, so I, I finished my PhD in 2016 um, at Penn with Stephanie Weirich. That was fantastic. If any of you are, any of you is thinking about a PhD, I can't recommend sort of Penn and Stephanie highly enough. That was a really great experience. Um, uh, and then um, uh, the reason I got a PhD actually was to teach at a place um, like, like Bryn Mawr College, which is where I, I had been working. Um, it's sort of a small undergraduate focused institution. Um, and you know, I, I really thought that that's what I wanted. And then when I got there, I, I realized that there really wasn't time to teach, research, and implement. Um, that I could figure out a way to, to teach and research at the same time, but, but my work is so sort of GHC dependent that it would feel, I would really feel like I was not doing my best job as a researcher if, um, if, if I weren't also implementing some of these ideas. So that didn't feel great. I could also, there was enough time to teach and implement. 
And, and luckily, actually, Bryn Mawr was open-minded enough to say, you know, if you're contributing to these, this open source project and people around the world are using what you're, you know, are what you're writing, then maybe that's okay. And, you know, you, can, you should publish a little bit, but, but actually, if most of your publications are in the form of open source commits, we'll, we'll continue to pay you for that. And I thought that was very open-minded of them. I was very pleased. Um, but, but actually, to do a proper job of implementing GHC, you also need to publish lots of papers. Um, I don't think you can do sort of a top end compiler implementation without doing proper research. So that didn't quite feel right either. And, and so it became um, that, that I gave up on the teaching, um, which, which makes me sad because I really enjoy teaching. Um, but um, I mean, so far so good. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying sort of being able to focus more on the research and on the implementation parts than I had been able to do previously. Um, in terms of, of my specific thing, you know, Twig, like I couldn't be happier. Um, Twig is a, is, is, is a great company to, to work for. There's a whole bunch of really interesting people working on interesting problems. There's a lot of, of you know, every week we have sort of these internal seminars on, uh, there's called knowledge sharing where, you know, different people are introducing their different ideas of, of, of what they're working on. Um, some great stuff going on there. And, you know, they are forward thinking enough to pay me to do what it is I want. Um, you know, so it's, it feels sort of like a, you know, a, a dream job that, that fell into my lap a little bit in that, you know, they, they pay me to do what I want to do. Um, and as long as I keep sort of publishing papers and stay active in the community and, and such, um, they're happy. So um, yeah, yeah, that's, it's, it's, been a, it's been a very easy transition. I'm a little bit jealous. What is your title then? A uh, principal researcher. Okay, I was going to guess that, uh, or I probably read it in your bio and forgot. Sure. And that means that um, some of your work is relevant to the problems that Tweeg is solving, or this doesn't even matter. I mean, I, I don't know what Tweeg does exactly. Um, oh, okay, yeah. So, so Tweeg is um, they they brand themselves a software innovation lab. I mean, it's a software consultancy. Um, you know where. Uh, much more so than, than just sort of building a product and shipping it to, to clients. Um, uh, the, the, the Twig model is to really embed engineers in client teams and sort of work almost without sort of a boundary between the Twig folk and the sort of the client folk um, with a particular eye toward taking our expertise and teaching um, teaching sort of the folks, who, the engineers of the clients a little bit more about, you know, solid CI practices and good deployment practices and reproducible builds and sort of all of this nice stuff. Um, so where does my work fit in with that? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. It's, you know, we like to use the best technologies that are out there for, for a given purpose. And so we like to then develop those technologies when appropriate. And so I think that's, that's sort of my job is, you know, as we run into to, to problems, you know, oh, can we make this work better? Well, then that ends up getting passed over to me. Can we do some research on this type system so that we can implement this solution uh, in, a, in a more idiomatic way? Um, but, you know, so far it's been pretty open-ended. I'm not, my research directions are not driven by particular client needs. I think, you know, the, I, I try to keep my stuff applicable enough that, that it, it sort of can flow the other way. But, but Twig is working with companies that use Haskell in production. Yes, yes, very much so. Okay, so you're raising the profile. So yeah, and that's my that's my other job. That's sort of what I was saying at the beginning. If those of you who are here before the talk a little bit, you know, this is work for me. Um, it's very much an explicit part of my job at Twig to show up at things like this and you know um, and and spread the good word. Yeah, lucky us. Um, Matthias has another question. I think I have to read it. I've read some authors claiming that there's no guarantee in dependent types that a functions type can be inferred. Is that a formal proof or only a pragmatic view? Is the same true for simple Haskell types? And then there's actually a follow-up discussion happening, it looks like. Um, so it's, it is true that if you, have a de if you write a, a dependently typed function, and you just write the definition of it, you can't generally infer its type. But if we restrict the sort of goal of type inference, then, then we're just fine. So in, in Haskell, maybe we support dependent types, 
but we say we only infer non-dependent types. Um, and so if you write a function that only can, they can only be well typed with a dependent type, maybe we would reject it. But if you wrote the, 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 the type signature, we could accept it then. But that's already true today in, in some cases, right? If you use higher rank types uh, in Haskell, there are functions that I can write that would be rejected without a type signature. But if I just write the type signature, then GHC is happy to accept. Dependent types would just be more of that. Um, and in particular, the inference that we can do today will still be possible tomorrow. Nothing about sort of Haskell 98 gets lost. Um, so let's people, are, people are promoting the um, Tweak YouTube channel. Oh, yes, yes. I was wondering if, when I should sneak that in. <laughs> yeah, so every, every Monday um, at, I guess it's right now noon UTC, um, uh, a new video. They, I try to keep them to 10 minutes. They're usually closer to 15. Um, uh, pops up on whatever I happen to be thinking about at the moment. But it's almost always something involving GHC. OK, I think um, there are no further questions. And we've uh, kept you for quite a while this evening, this evening in Berlin, this afternoon where you are. Sure. This is really great. Unfortunately, we, um, we can't wrap up with uh, beer and pizza social hour. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, would be, would be. Well, one day you'll fly over to Berlin once again, and uh, we can yeah. do that in person all yeah, together. Yeah, yeah that, would be, that would be fun. Yes, missing German beer. German beer is very good beer. American, <laughs> yeah. American, American beer is terrible. Now, when, you, when, you, uh, when you live here, you have to uh, moderate your intake, of course. Yes. Um, so thank you once again for uh, accepting the invitation and joining us. Oh let's yeah, this, my pleasure. Let's let's do this again, you know, virtually or in the real world, someday. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks very much. Yeah, and I and I salute the audience for all of your great questions and your participation. I hope this was uh, enjoyable for you as uh, as much as it was for us, Richard. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely, it was a good time. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.